The crown is a tangible entity in one aspect, but intangible in another because it's also an ideology. So even though the queen wears the crown, she is only the proprietor for the time that she's alive. She's not the owner because the crown actually owns everything that the queen stands for and does in a public capacity, not a private capacity. Welcome to episode three of The Firm, Blood, Lies and Royal Succession. I'm your host for this podcast, Jonathan Locke. We're taking a deep dive into 500 years of British royal family and the secrets, scandals, conspiracies and cover-ups that continue to fascinate us to this day. There's always been this problem of trying to basically shape the narrative and and try and hide the embarrassing stories. And it's always been a cat and mouse game between historians and the royal family and those around them in terms of how the image is portrayed. And we're also investigating how everything the royal family does is shaped and controlled by something called the firm, protecting, promoting and continuing the royal brand above all else. Why are the royals so... Why do they want to preserve the British royal family? They see the monarchy as a vital part of the fabric of the culture of the United Kingdom. Now we're going to look at the reign of George III, to the ruthless king whose tyranny over the colonies sparked the American War of Independence. You had George painted as a complete tyrant. He had to be because obviously he was the head of state of what the revolution is regarded as an occupying power. To some, the unhinged lunatic whose bouts of insanity nearly forced him to abdicate. He would be ill for a few hours, or it could last a few days, and just make him incapacitated to the point where he would have bouts of fits, and sometimes simultaneously. And it just got to the point where they couldn't keep him in front of the public. They had the regency and they locked him away in Windsor Castle. But to others, something different altogether. He was, in fact, an Enlightenment monarch. He was a Renaissance prince in many ways. He was somebody who took his sort of benevolent duties as a monarch extremely seriously. The length of his reign, I think, added certain stability for nearly 60 years. But, and the wars, the Napoleonic wars, I mean, that was obviously glorious when it came to Waterloo and also Trafalgar and the Nile. So with Nelson and Wellington, there's little doubt that George had a very considerable cash able. So who was the real George III? The mad tyrant who lost America? Or the Renaissance prince who stood alone against the might of Napoleon? Why is history apparently so confused about him? And what does that mean for the firm itself? George III is definitely one of the most fascinating kings, not only for his own story, but for the way that story has been told in the 200 years since his death. He was born in June 1738, the grandson of King George II. His father, who was supposed to become king after George II, died when George was just 12, leaving him heir to the throne far younger than he would have expected. His grandfather was to last another 10 years, and George III was 22 when, in October 1760, he became king. In his ascension speech, he declared, Born and educated in this country, I glory in the name of Britain. He was to reign for a further 59 years and 96 days, longer than any of his predecessors. Only Queen Victoria and Elizabeth II have lived and reigned longer. Historian Andrew Roberts is author of The Last King of America, The Misunderstood Reign of George III. I was particularly interested in George III because he is our most longest reigning king. Uh, He's king for 60 years, from 1760 to 1820. And during that time, he came to the throne during the Seven Years' War and, of course, had to fight and lose the American War of Independence and also was king during the Napoleonic Wars. So for a military historian, he really did span the the three uh, great wars of that period, two of which we won and one of which we famously lost. And he's also been somebody who I think over the years has been 
unfairly maligned for a great number of things. So I think it's a good time to revisit him in a much less stigmatizing and aggressive way. I think that there's been a metamorphosis in looking at this particular monarch, because if you mentioned George III, people would, here anyway, would probably, and probably in America, would have thought of the mad king who lost America. The Mad King Who Lost America If most people only knew two things about George III, it's that firstly, he was the king against whom the American War of Independence was fought, and second, that he was declared insane. Both are true, so how has George III been, in the words of Andrew Roberts, unfairly maligned? He reckons it's all about propaganda. You've got a set of historians who try to make him out to be a dictator, essentially. And uh, this, of course, was picked up enthusiastically during his lifetime, this whole idea, by Thomas Jefferson, who in the Declaration of Independence said that he was unfit to be the ruler of the free people. And so, very sadly, he's had a terrible reputation historically. And that's why, for the last 200 years or so, people have considered quite wrongly that he was a despot or a tyrant. And it simply was not the case. Every citizen in the United States knows about the War of Independence. Events like the Boston Tea Party and the Battle of Saratoga, and phrases like no taxation without representation, are taught in every school in the land. And with them comes the same narrative. The remote, snobbish, tyrannical English king imposing unreasonable demands upon the colonies. Thomas Paine's famous work, Common Sense of 1775, in which he demanded independence, described George as the royal brute, and even the Declaration of Independence itself talks of, to quote, repeated injuries inflicted upon the American people by the king, as well as, quote, his absolute tyranny over the colonies. Here's royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliams. The American experience was one of the great disasters because it was the no taxation without representation, which is absolutely unanswerable. That the British ministers believed, or British politicians believed, that if you wanted protection, you should pay for it, is one thing. And that also that they thought they could raise revenue from stamp duty or whatever was another. I don't think the British politicians were particularly gung-ho for the war. King George certainly wasn't. The fact was that by the 1760s and early 1770s, the Americans were ready to have their own country. They had a 2.5 million population, a burgeoning economy. And so um, they wanted to become independent. And there was no sense on the British side of wanting to um, oppress them. And yet, oppress them, the British certainly did. There's no doubt he was obstinate when it came to America. In those days, monarchs regarded themselves as, putting it mildly, a cut above the rest, so to speak. Would any sovereign allow the equivalent of the American colonies to become independent without attempting to keep them? And the answer is, depending on the country and its armed forces and potential, probably not. No country just allowed colonies of theirs to break off and secede. And so you had a impasse and unfortunately it led to violence, but it wasn't something that any British politician was hoping for or looking forward to. As Burke so famously said, that it wasn't the point of whether or not you had a right to make your people miserable but that it was not more in your interest to make them happy. It would have been so easy with so many loyalists, which was a very large part of the American population, to have, at least for a while, placated those who wanted drastic change. And of course, George, because it was a civil war of a sort, you had George painted as a complete tyrant. The story was set. The liberty championing freedom fighters of America rebelling against the unreasonable demands of a remote, tyrannical royal brute some 3,000 miles away.
And to some extent, the narrative is true. Certainly, George's refusal to actually visit America didn't help matters, and there was undoubtedly complacency and even arrogance amongst the British politicians and military commanders about their ability to control the Americans. Executive editor of TheRoyalObserver.com, Jacqueline Roth, explains. You have to remember, Britain was at this time a genuine world superpower. In 1763, they'd won what's called the Seven Years' War, which was basically a struggle between Britain and France for control of North America, as well as in Europe and India. If they could beat France, they were pretty confident that they could handle a few restless colonials. But according to Thomas Mace Archer Mills, founder of the British Monarchist Society, the American grievances against the king were not quite as justified as they made out. The way many in Britain saw it, the taxes levied against the colonies were payback for having saved them from the French a decade earlier in the Seven Years' War, a war in which, he also points out, George Washington fought for the British against the French. Right. Well, this is a story. It's detrimental in so many ways. And this is the thing. I don't know if you've been to Mount Vernon. They're very proud there to illustrate that George Washington was the man who fired the first shots of the French and Indian War, known as the Seven Years' War. So the British Parliament at that time said, you know what, if you colonials are going to start a war, you should have to help fund and pay for it. And that's when the Americans got angry because they had been so used to being spoiled by being part of the empire and not having to pay their fair share. It may not be a popular interpretation of history today, but it does neatly encapsulate the view in London at the time. So when the British Parliament came down and said, look, we're not only fighting in that sphere over there because of you, we're fighting the French, we're going over to Flanders, we're doing all of this other stuff, we're fighting everywhere, we need money and you need to help us. So that was number one. That was the first check by the Americans against the king because it's always the king that you would blame, because it's his parliament after all, and you're his subjects after all. So if you are unhappy subjects, who do you blame? Not those who are making and enacting the laws, but the one who was signing it, which was George III. So the British parliament had a tax rise on the Americans. They didn't like it. That's why you had the Tea Party in Boston, once the fighting had begun, that same British belief in their own superiority was to be their undoing, as well as a bit of prime opportunism from Britain's old enemies, the French and the Spanish. It was a complete lack of communication. It was the British using tactics they used in Europe in wars in terrain that were totally different. I mean, the British won quite a number of the battles and, of course, had a hold over some of the cities. But the conduct of the war, or the use of German mercenaries and the tactics they used and using or relying on orders from so far away. I mean, it led to France and Spain joining the war. And I think it's fair to say it's the one time since the Spanish Armada up to, who could say, almost the Second World War, that Britain lost command of the seas because French and Spanish ships aiding the Americans made the continuation of the war pretty impossible. There's no doubt the French and Spanish got involved not so much out of sympathy with the Americans, but as a chance to stick it to the Brits. At the height of the War of Independence in 1779, they even put together a new French and Spanish armada to try to actually invade England. In August of that year, 66 French and Spanish battleships entered the English Channel, loaded with some 30,000 troops intent on conquering England. George III described it as the most serious crisis the nation ever knew. Incredibly, none of the troops ever landed. It's one of those weird historical parallels. The famous Spanish Armada, faced by Elizabeth I 200 years earlier, was defeated partly because of the weather. And so was this one. They simply couldn't get the right winds, they lost their chance, and they withdrew. Another problem faced by the king at this time, and to his enemies, just further proof that he was unfit to rule, was concerns over the state of his mind. But unfortunately, he also had this thing called the king's malady, 
which historically everybody seems to, for the last half century or so, have uh, assumed was a disease called porphyria. But my book proves that uh, it was not porphyria at all, but bipolar disorder. George had suffered his first bout of mental illness in 1765, shortly after the Seven Years' War. He had what's called a prodrome attack in 1765, where he was ill for about four months. But that wasn't terribly serious, although he was kept out of uh, the public eye for that period. Much more serious was the 1788 attack, which uh, lasted several months, four months, and which had him foaming at the mouth, had him needing to be held down. He was swearing. He spoke continually for 24 hours on one occasion. Whether it was porphyria, a disease of the liver which acutely affects the nervous system, or as Andrew Roberts believes, bipolar disorder, George's illness was severe and his symptoms dramatic. What is so significant is that people even now don't necessarily understand what it was, what the extraordinary nature of the disease that made him known as the Mad King was. He was abusive, and this is very uh, unlike him. He never swore normally when he was well. And he was subjected to almost torture by his doctors, who none of whom understood anything to do with manic depression. In fact, they didn't really understand very much to do with mental illness at all back in the, that late 18th century period. And he was straight jacketed and attached to a chair for hours and hours, days sometimes on end. And uh, they took blood from him and cupped him and did various other things which are just too uh, uh, depressing and pathos-ridden, really. And, of course, did him absolutely no good at all. I mean, he had to be restrained. It was that he'd talk for hours on end, this sort of thing. Yes, he was physically ungovernable, apparently. And these, no one is absolutely certain as to precisely, you know, he could talk, I, I read, for over 50 hours non-stops, this sort of thing. It was absolutely awful. If George's first attack had been largely kept from the public, as the disease progressed, rumours that the king had gone mad spread around the world. The first prodrome attack was kept secret in 1765. But by 1778, it was impossible to keep it secret. It had gone on too long. It was too publicly visible. The whole of the court were talking about it. It got into the press and uh, it was debated in Parliament. He would go after ladies and sometimes he would want to take off his dressing gown and run around the corridors naked or go outside the castle and run through the fields naked. And he would get this paranoia that would drive him to do things that any normal person would say, wait a minute, I need to stop myself. This isn't what I would normally do. But unfortunately, his mental state, along with the sickness, removed that filter. There was no rational being there. So he would touch people and try to perform acts on them that normally would never be acceptable. Uh, he would even call people names. It was almost as if he had a form of Tourette's as well, just not even thinking about it. And then he would gesture to people, grabbing himself or pulling up his dressing gown and these sorts of things. And so very lewd behavior from someone who was a king. And then when he would come back into himself, and he was told what he did, he would just be absolutely so ashamed, it would spiral him the other way. So unfortunately, for as amusing as some people might like to have think and thought that that was, it's not. This is a man who was deeply disturbed and sick. They didn't even have a name for porphyria, which is this physiological disease that he was later thought to have had. So the whole thing was just done as best as the doctors of the late 18th century could do, which unfortunately wasn't very much. So he had music played to him, people read to him and talked to him, and they used drugs a bit more than holding him down and pushing him into a chair and so on. By 1789, the situation had got so serious that Parliament was forced to take the most dramatic action they could to force a regency where his son and heir, the Prince of Wales, would effectively take over the throne. 
Coming just six years after losing the American War of Independence, it's easy to see how history has labelled George as a failure. You can't help but feel sorry for him because he wasn't in control of himself. And his story is so sad because he was literally a stroke of the pen away from resigning his post, from abdicating of being king. And then Parliament had to decide what kind of a regency the Prince of Wales would sort of take over and be in charge of. And so the whole thing was very public. And yet, despite everything, this is only half the story of George III. In 1789, right at the point where he was about to have his throne taken away from him, George made an extraordinary recovery. It's totally unbelievable, really. He'd been so severely ill that the British Parliament had come to the huge step of effectively forcing him to abdicate. And then suddenly, right at the last minute, he gets better again. And it's like, right guys, I'm back, what's happening? And so that happened in February 1789, once he returned to sanity. He returned to sanity only just a few days before the Regency Act was about to be passed. So it couldn't have happened at a better time. And also when he got better, because he was a beloved king in Britain, when he got better, there were huge nationwide celebrations up and down the country. The nation went into full-scale celebration. And of course also, it was only four months before the French Revolution broke out. Huge nationwide celebrations. That doesn't exactly sound like the sort of reaction one might expect from a people led by a mad tyrant or a failed king. Here's Richard Fitzwilliams and Thomas Mace Archer Mills. There were aspects of George that were extremely good, that were positive. And again, we come back to image. This has been a problem for years because the American disaster and the madness tended to obscure the fact that he was in many ways a rather remarkable individual. He is still very much a villain in American eyes, whereas in British eyes, he's not. There's a lot of sympathy for him. And where he's known as the Mad King in America, he's known as the Farmer King in the United Kingdom. He was known as Farmer George. He was keen on having an image that was basic, down-to-earth and patriotic. In the United Kingdom, he was so loved and revered, he was known as the Farmer King. He would go out and talk to people in their farms and ask them about growing their crops, and he shared a love of the people and the land. So it was confusing for him to say, well, on this hand, I'm loved here on this side of the Atlantic, but I'm absolutely hated amongst my subjects on the other side of the Atlantic. As Andrew Roberts explains, far from being the royal brute Thomas Paine and numerous historians since have claimed him to be, George was something of a visionary when it came to the arts, culture, and science. What none of them ever do is to talk about how he was the man who created the Royal Academy. In Britain, the Royal Academy of Arts, he collected over half of the Royal Collection, which is the largest art collection in the world today, in private hands. He built up the center of the British Library, the nucleus of it today is the 80,000 books that he built up in his library. The Science Museum today has many of the scientific instruments, the largest collection of scientific instruments in the world that he built up as well. His support, indeed, is championing of architecture. These are the glories of the age, Georgian architecture, the neoclassical beautiful buildings that he supported, tremendously important. The planet Uranus was named after him. It originally uh, was called George's Star after him, because not least because he helped Sir William Herschel and he built the largest telescope in the world. Handel said of him that while that young man lives, my music will never need a champion. So really he was able to speak four languages, he played four instruments. He was so much more than the kind of babbling idiot that you get in almost all of the representations of him. George also put into place many of the traditions, institutions and symbols that define the royal brand today. 
Much of the modern monarchy comes from things that George III invented, like, well, the Buckingham Palace, of course. He bought Buckingham Palace for his wife, Queen Charlotte. The great gold state coach, which is used for all the state openings of Parliament and the coronation. Even now, um, 250 years later, he, he bought that in 1761 for the coronation. The Trooping of the Colour, which is now a regular annual event. It was George III that made it an annual event. He uh, invented the royal enclosure at Ascot, and he was the first monarch since Charles I to be buried at Windsor Castle. And since then, all of the monarchs have been buried in or around Windsor. So he was quite inventive in that sense. And also, he had a prudent attitude towards finances, very prudent, and he was frugal in his eating and drinking. He was immensely hardworking. He was faithful, of course, to his spouse, and he believed that his was a life of duty. And so you see, I think, in the present Queen, many of those traits, and I think that they date back to George III much more than to Queen Victoria, who is usually given the credit for creating the modern monarchy. George also had another nickname and one far less derogatory than the Mad King. The British people called him Farmer George, which was not an insult, but a term of endearment. It meant like, he's one of us. Yes, the Farmer George, he was called, which was um, actually intended to be a bit of a slight by intellectuals against him. But in fact, of course, at a time when 80% of people took their livelihoods from agriculture. The fact that he wrote articles about things like crop manure and crop rotation and so on actually was held to be a good thing by an awful lot of people. The point being that his grandfather George II and great-grandfather George I had been very German and it was his wish to be identified more with you could say an average type of Englishman. And of course, at that time, so many were agricultural. And he would have seen what he would call basic values. He was recognised as being good-natured, very much a family man. He was the only one of his whole dynasty, of the Hanoverian dynasties, who uh, was faithful to his wife. The supposedly snobbish, arrogant, elite ruler was actually a king more in touch with the ordinary men and women of his realm than most of his predecessors. And a great deal of his popularity with the working people came from his stable family life. He had strong morals. He married Charlotte of Mecklenburg Schwedditz, and they were happily married. George had married Charlotte, a German princess, in 1761, and they remained faithful to one another until her death 57 years later, having 15 children together. It was this belief in the sanctity of marriage, and the importance of royal unions especially, that led him to introduce what's called the Royal Marriages Act, a law that essentially forbade members of the royal family from legally marrying without the consent of the sovereign. He brought in the Royal Marriages Act of 1772 because so many of his brothers and uncles had contracted marriages that were not helpful to Britain strategically, essentially. And uh, so he wanted to make sure that if they did get married, it was to Protestant princes and princesses in order to help Britain's position in the world, rather than marrying their mistresses, which is essentially what they were doing at the time. It was another example of George looking to secure the strength and longevity of the firm. And it's still in effect today. It was passed in 1772 and it hasn't been repealed, so it stays in effect. When Prince Harry, for example, married Meghan Markle, he needed to get the Queen's permission to do so by law. Otherwise, the marriage would not have been legal in Britain. Perhaps George III's greatest achievement, and certainly what many historians believe should be his true legacy, was his victory in the Napoleonic Wars and the final defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815. That battle remains one of the most celebrated military successes in British history. There's no doubt that the war against Napoleon, where Britain stood alone, and we do tend to forget that. We remember 1940 against Nazi Germany, but of course, Napoleon was a very, very serious threat. 
The French Revolution of 1789, in which their monarchy had been overthrown and thousands guillotined in the streets of Paris, horrified and terrified Europe, and Napoleon Bonaparte's subsequent invasion of most of the continent made the American War of Independence look almost trivial in comparison. It certainly was a crisis. Some small percentage of Britons actually thought that it was a good thing and agreed with the um, French Revolution. But most of them, especially once they chopped off King Louis XVI's head and indeed Marie Antoinette's head and descended into terror, people hung on to the monarchy all the more, realising in Britain that it was extremely dangerous to take a risk like that. Napoleon was just unstoppable at that time, and this is where a newly recovered George really stepped up to the plate. He was definitely helped by having some brilliant generals in the Duke of Wellington and Admiral Nelson, but he also famously said that in the event of an invasion, he would take up arms himself to fight for England. And somehow, he managed to do what no one else could and defeat Napoleon. And was very fortunate that you had a sane king and a very good prime minister in William Pitt the Younger to deal with the strains and stresses of a revolution in France that chopped off the king's head. The two decisive battles of the Napoleonic War, firstly at sea when Admiral Nelson's outnumbered navy inflicted a stunning defeat on yet another French and Spanish invasion fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, and then at Waterloo under the command of the Duke of Wellington ten years later, not only extinguished the threat of Bonaparte's reign of terror expanding over all Europe, but also once again reasserted Britain as the world's preeminent superpower and set the stage for the expansion of the British Empire that would see it eventually hold sway over an astonishing 24% of the Earth's total land area. If losing America made Britain look weak, it only took a few decades later for them to become the most powerful nation in the world again. That's a pretty incredible turnaround. So the politicians and you know, a large number of the British people in, in Britain believed that the American War of Independence was just by no means all, and of course, it, as I say, it cost Britain control of the seas and a disaster. But equally, you had the Napoleonic Wars following shortly afterwards, which were, of course, a truly remarkable success in them. It, I don't think that I can think of the British suffering a single serious defeat. And since so many other nations did, in Europe, it's, that's phenomenal. Unfortunately, however, what should have been George III's greatest triumph and his crowning legacy was overshadowed by the return of his illness. The day after his Golden Jubilee in 1810, he fell into his fifth attack of manic depression and he went completely insane. By this stage, he was also blind and deaf and senile. And is it that it was maybe some sort of other sickness that was brought out by all of the emotional and mental deep disturbing that was associated with losing the colonies and having wars on all fronts and just feeling the way he felt after it was all said and done. So the last years of George III's life were anything but royal and regal. There was no dignity, there was no dignified way of treating this man who is still king in name but not in power. This time there was to be no recovery from the king's malady. In 1811, Parliament finally passed the Regency Act they had proposed 22 years earlier, and his son, George IV, Prince of Wales, acted as regent until his own ascension. Everything was stripped of him. Everything. His royal authority was given to his son in a regency. His doctors would occasionally, I think once a year, maybe once every six months, they would go to Parliament and tell a uh, parliamentary committee, i.e. the people who were ultimately paying the doctor's bills, whether there'd been any improvement at all in the previous six months. And there hadn't been. For the last 10 years, there'd been nothing but even further decline. So the depression really set in. And in the end, it drove him mad. And that's why it's called the madness of King George, because he just eventually shut everything down. He was pretty much dead, but still breathing. 
There was no activity there. There was just looking out the window, mumbling to people as if he knew what he was saying, but he just wasn't making any sense. He wasn't speaking, just mumbling, blowing bubbles. George III was to spend the final 10 years of his life confined to Windsor Castle, mentally and physically broken. His sickness affected him to the point where he ended up dying alone at Windsor Castle. He stayed in his apartments continually for the last 10 years of his life, never leaving them. He didn't know what was going on. When the Queen died in 1818, he followed two years later. He couldn't comprehend it. He just played the harpsichord for hours and on end, and then finally died in January 1820. George III died on January 29, 1820, aged 81. He had been king for nearly 60 years and had not only seen off the greatest military threat to his country since the Spanish Armada of 1588, but he had also been a huge patron of the arts and sciences and had put into place many of the traditions, symbols and practices that define the modern British royal brand. And despite the suffering and indignity of his final 10 years, he remained incredibly popular with the British people. His death was followed by a long period of national mourning. So why then, 200 years later, is George remembered with such scorn, mockery and even contempt? Well, for Thomas Mace Archer Mills and Andrew Roberts, the answer lies in America and a centuries-long smear campaign. George III is unfairly treated in history, especially from the American point of view, because you need an antagonist, you need someone bad. And there are some books that are still published in America, only one in 2019, that essentially made him out to be a congenital idiot. And he's called unintelligent and stupid and all that kind of stuff. You don't set up the Royal Academy if you're a congenital idiot. You don't do all of those other things that I mentioned if you're stupid. And there's so much of George III that if Americans really knew the truth and stopped seeing him as the villain but tried to understand him as the king who was holding a country together, who was not an absolute monarch, and this is what I try to tell my American friends when we get on the subject when I'm back in America. I say, but you're forgetting that Elizabeth I, Henry VIII, Charles I, they're not the same constitutionally structured sovereign that George III was. George III had a proper parliament that was making his laws. It wasn't a king or a queen saying, I am doing this and I order America to pay this. That's not the way it was. It was Parliament who levied the taxes, not the King. Was George III unfairly maligned by America's founding fathers in order to justify a war against him? And was his mental illness used as a weapon in their smear campaign? You need that villain to actually justify why things were done the way they were done. And the American Revolution didn't have to be what it was. It didn't have to turn out that way. And General George Washington, his issue, the reason he was so involved in going against the British is that he, being British, didn't get what he wanted. He wanted to be a British gentleman's officer. He was never given that ability. So he was angry with his own people because he didn't get what he wanted. George Washington is a character here who was very happy to be British until it didn't suit him in his agenda anymore. He was also a person who I think has been completely misunderstood by history because of two things. Recently, the musical, Hamilton the Musical, in which he's held up to be the sort of personification of evil, really, although in a very amusing way. And also the Declaration of Independence, which makes some 28 charges against him, 26 of which I believe to be rubbish. So he, throughout American history, has been made the villain and has been put the blame on for everything that America went through, which really was unfair because it wasn't so much the king at all. 
And for Andrew Roberts, the anti-George propaganda campaign continues today, even reaching the stages of Broadway. Oh, well, in the show Hamilton, he's uh, made out to be a camp, sadistic, prancing, slightly idiotic figure who sings songs about how he wants to kill Americans' um, families in order to remind them of his love. It's a very funny production and I did enjoy it and I, and I tapped my foot along with the rest of it and the, and the songs are very catchy. But historically, it is complete and utterly false in every possible way. He was none of the things that I've just mentioned. George III may just be the most misunderstood British monarch in history, whether that's by accident or by design. And he also represents, for perhaps the only time in the last 500 years of the British royal family, a failure of the firm to look after its own reputation above all else. It's not a mistake they would make again. Next time on The Firm, Blood, Lies and Royal Succession. There's no doubt that Victoria's image has changed radically, especially when she was young, where she was lively, loved sex, was very tempestuous. After a while, there was no hiding her fondness for him or her desire to promote him. In fact, she wanted to knight him also. And no one knew anything. It was tightly controlled. Of course, they put their foot down and said that would be too much. But I think it was also to preserve the image, the brand image of the, how could the queen stoop to being friendly and being intimate with a brown man. And no one knew anything. It was 